Welcome to the Derenberg Lecture. Is that what everybody intended to show up for? <laughs> well, can you hear me? I, I'm not wired, but I'm trying to project. Yes. Um, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce the Nuremberg Lectures. And for those of you that don't know, the Nuremberg Chair is one of, I think, the greatest things about our program of design here at Carnegie Mellon. And it is a visiting professorship that was established through the generous um, donation of one of uh, our CMU alums, um, who recently and very sadly passed away, Theodore Nuremberg. And he was the founder of Dansk International Designs. And what he did was he endowed a chair that allows someone, some interesting person, to come and spend either a term or an entire year with us each year. And it's a great way to introduce vitality and new thinking into the program and get the benefit of folks that have been out there doing very different, very interesting things. And it's a long tradition now. It's been happening for, Steve, how many years has it been happening now? Fifteen. Fifteen, which is an incredibly long time for a design program such as ours to be enjoying that kind of replenishment every, every year. So, this is a very big thing for us, and I believe it's become one of the most prestigious appointments probably in the United States within design education. So this year we are incredibly proud to have George, um, Carol, <laughs> <laughs> Carol Nelson here with us. He's going to be here with us until the spring. And I'm just going to refer to my notes right now so that I won't mess up his name again. I'm so sorry, Harold. Um, I'm going to read this very lengthy um, set of accomplishments, which is incredibly humbling. Um, Harold has a distinguished and multifaceted background. He's a licensed architect in California, having received his undergraduate and graduate degrees from Montana State and UC Berkeley, respectively. He studied architecture at the Technical University in Helsinki, Finland, and has taught architecture at Texas Tech University, where he received the President's Award for Teaching Excellence. In addition to his role as an educator, he's also a consultant, researcher, and author, known for his work in the areas of design thinking and system science, which is an incredibly rich and exciting area for design. He's worked with nonprofit corporations, state and federal agencies, international governments, and the United Nations. He's the past president of the International Society for Systems Science, a position that was previously held by such notable people as Margaret Mead, Ilya Prigozhin, and Russell Aikoff. And he's the founding, he's the co-founding director and president of the Advanced Design Institute, a not-for-profit educational organization. He's also the co-author of a groundbreaking book, The Design Way, Intentional Change in an Unpredictable World, which received the Outstanding Book of the Year Award from the Division of Instructional Development of the Association for Educational Communications and Technology, and a book which many of us in the department are reading right now with great interest. And we look forward to hearing him talk more about those ideas now. So we're absolutely delighted to have Harold with us. And please join me in welcoming him now. Okay. So can everybody hear me all right? Okay. Well, I have to say, first of all, that I'm very honored to have been chosen to be, uh, be the chair for this year. And I'm very, very grateful to Mr. Nimberg for his championing design, uh, God knows, uh, design needs champions like that, and uh, it's just unfortunate I, I won't be able to meet him. I want to thank uh, the School of Design for taking the chance on me, and um, Terry and Steve and the staff and faculty that uh, brought me in. I very much appreciate that. And oh, I have to thank my own staff as well, uh, my wife and two daughters that have kept me presentable for two years. More, many years. <laughs> Worked very hard at doing that. Um, what I want to do is sort of uh, uh, 
give you a bit of a disclaimer in the beginning and then to give you some background on uh, what I'm going to be up to with the presentation. Uh, part of the disclaimers are that uh, these opinions are my own and not the opinion, opinions of management necessarily. And no animals were hurt in the production of this presentation, although there was a little dog that had to walk me three times a day while I was thinking of all these things up. Uh, but she had a strong union. She... <laughs> um, what this is, uh, what I like to do, whenever I get to a new city, a large city, I like to find one of those buses that sort of travels around the city and there's somebody there sort of pointing out the different landmarks as you're going around. And that really helps me get oriented, whether it's in London or Paris or whatever, wherever it is. So that's kind of what this is because there is a lot, a lot behind all of this. So what I'm going to do is sort of uh, play like tour guide and we're just going to go around and I'm going to point out some landmarks. And hopefully you'll have enough interest maybe to come back and spend a little more time at each one of those spots. And hopefully you'll catch where the new construction is as well as the old classic buildings and squares and that sort of thing. So that's the strategy that uh, I'm going to use. This is not <clears throat> anything that can present, be presented in a kind of a linear fashion. So this is not going to be one of those things, everything follows from the other until we get to the final summation. This really is one of those tours um, around a city. So. Um, the two things that I've really been working with, uh, especially with uh, Eric Stolterman, who co-authored the uh, book, The Design Way, with me, <clears throat> two things that we became very interested in. One was uh, creating a culture of design, and the other was creating a design culture. And um, right now, for this presentation, I'm going to focus on creating a culture of design, just the one. Although both are equally important, and um, I don't think one can survive without the other. But we just don't have time, unless you have nothing to do tonight and we can, we can go on. So, <clears throat> a little bit about me is that um, I am an architect. I still occasionally sneak away and do architecture, or at least I advise people about it, critique things. But I love being an architect. I love everything about um, that profession, what it meant, uh, what it does mean. And uh, I really appreciated the ability to uh, work with a profession. Um, the thing that uh, sort of, uh, uh, as exciting as it was, it sort of uh, brought up some interesting issues that I couldn't quite get my hands around when I was in practice. Um, there was kind of a triggering incident. I was going to take over a firm as the um, design architect, the sort of form giver architect. And we got a couple of commissions in the firm that sort of sent me off in a totally different direction. One was to design a new city hall for Colorado Springs and one was to um, increase a um, medical facility in a small town in Wyoming by three or four times its size. And uh, when they told me why, it was during a boom era when we had an energy crisis. Most of you probably don't remember that we had one back in the 70s, but there was an energy crisis. And they said, um, well, we're going to have a lot more domestic violence. We're going to have a lot more drug abuse. We're going to have a lot more and they started listing off these things, and I thought, you know, a bigger building isn't the solution to what you're facing. And the issue to me is what was happening to stress these people to behave uh, in a way that was so counter to their well-being. And the same thing happened with the city hall. Was I was what's called programming in, in the firm. I was deciding sizes and things like that of the building. And I got the city manager and people in the government all involved in talking about what democracy was and how it played out in the city. Because maybe it didn't belong in a building, for instance. 
well, we got way out on the limb and I had no way of getting everybody back. And so I figured I need some help with these kinds of issues because I'm starting to not think within uh, the kind of focused way I should be. So when you had big issues, big questions like that, um, you would go to someplace like Berkeley. So that's what I did. And I <coughs> was hoping that I would find um, the answers at Berkeley. And it turns out that what happened was that I found better questions. And it's turned out for me, uh, anyway, that questions are much more important than answers. Because as you go along, you sort of implement some of your answers, but you know that the bigger question is always unfolding. And the question sends you out in the direction that you're going to go, and that is an essential activity, is getting in the right direction. And that ties into something else I can uh, talk about later. Anyway, um, what it also did was it started uh, helping me create alliances and kind of trying to maintain new mind. Uh, when I was at Berkeley, a couple of things happened was that I met this strange crowd of uh, systems people from all over campus, some of them Nobel laureates and, and uh, just uh, very successful people. They were always kind of marginal in their departments in that they were really focused on something called systems. Anyway, I got drawn into that. Also, um, my professor, uh, Wes Churchman, put a, a seminar together with another faculty member on uh, design. And in my humility as an architect, I thought, who are you going to invite other than architects? Because we know what design is. I mean, what can I learn from other people about design? But they invited people from the National Labs, from the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, Lawrence Livermore, all the other departments. They all came into the seminar and they all talked about design. And I learned so much about design from that seminar. It was absolutely startling. So I decided what I need to do is really keep an open mind now and um, kind of continue building the alliances that I had. So one of the things, um, as I've been going along and um, sort of traveling this route, I didn't, I mean, I'm still a licensed architect, but I didn't stay within the profession necessarily. So um, I've kind of been an outlier in a lot of these things, meeting interesting people, uh, forming cabals, uh, conspiracies, that sort of thing. But what I found is that when design, championing design, when you interrogate it or when people interrogate it, uh, these are the kinds of questions that people come up with a lot. They ask it over and over again. Uh, the vis they're worried about the visibility of design or its relevance or its necessity, its credibility, legitimacy. And then my issue was that uh, I heard uh, there was an invisibility issue as well, which was different from the visibility issue. And these are sort of big questions that I felt I needed to have some response to if I was going to build further alliances with people. So as far as visibility go, and again, these are just examples. Uh, design is becoming highly visible in a lot of areas, which is good news. And um, I know the people in these two different uh, schools, and they've got considerable serious support for design thinking and for uh, what's called integrative thinking, and that's a code for systems thinking. I mean, this is money that you couldn't get from NSF or NEA or any of the other sort of federal agencies. This is serious. People with a lot of money are making an investment. The problem, my concern is that, for instance, in the business world now, systems or design thinking is becoming very popular. There's a lot in their literature. Uh, they talk about it a lot. That's good and bad news because one of the habits that uh, uh, business has, it's what's called management by bestseller, is that they go through these fluxes where somebody will write a book and they'll be enamored in that and they will uh, bring it into their organizations and it'll last a year or two and then they dismiss it. And they've never really invested 
in what the ideas were anyway, so that it never gets a full chance. So um, the equality movement, for instance. When Deming gave his last talk in Seattle, we asked him, uh, do people get what you're saying? He says, no. They keep paying me a lot of money to come out and talk to them, work with their organizations, and they don't get what quality is all about. But we had quality circles, we had all these things going on in organizations before it was sort of passed over as, well, that didn't work. That's the concern I have for design with all this high visibility right now is that it doesn't become just another fad. I already see the language in the literature coming up, people saying, well, the latest fad in business is design thinking. And I really hope that um, it doesn't get the same sort of treatments that some of the others have had. The other is um, relevance. And these are just a couple of uh, uh, conferences coming up I just picked up off of the, the web where it's showing that design is pushing at the boundaries. And this little graph comes from a graph that I had in my engineering economy textbook. Um, I'll confess, I started off as an architectural engineer. And uh, by the time I got to the fourth semester of, or quarter of calculus, I decided I wanted to do something else. But anyway, this was one of the graphs. And the essence, just in the, the two axes, was that the decisions made at the beginning of the project are much more consequential than the ones made later. And what I found in practice in the professions was that they were in this little area primarily. Somebody would make all the big important design decisions before they ever handed the brief into you and say, okay, now you do this. And what's happening now is that society is asking for and the professions, different professions are responding by pushing that <coughs> limit and increasing the space. Now, whether they're going to be successful then once they get the limits pushed, whether they're successful then at taking responsibility for those decisions, or they understand what those decisions are like, is the next question. That space will not be dealt with in the same way as we've dealt with this space. It takes different skills, it takes different approaches, it takes a lot of, and educationally, it's gonna make a difference as well. And this isn't counter to specialization, necessarily. This isn't counter to somebody being an industrial designer or any other software designer, any other thing. This is in uh, general. And the other thing is that there's a necessity for uh, design in that I don't know uh, how many people have noticed, but we've had some incredible impacts in society lately. Everything from 9-11 to economic collapses to um, global warming to the sky is falling. And what's happening is that routine expertise is sort of losing its cachet. The, all the reports that went in after 9-11 and into the, uh, uh, the uh, studies of the economic collapse, they discovered that routine expert Piece, having the answers for whatever the conditions are, you've got the answer, doesn't work anymore. Things have changed. Mostly, however, most education, I'm not talking about Carnegie Mellon or the School of Design, I don't know you well enough. Most education though, and I've done research with the, a center at University of Washington that's an NSF funded center looking at um, uh, learning in, in informal and formal environments, it's called. What they're working with is trying to change education so that we begin to educate at least adaptive experts. And all the studies that were done about oh, how you test for the kind of educational uh, models that you have, it's very easy if you have an input then you have an ex expected output and you can check to see if that person knows the answer. They're training routine experts. And it's important to be a routine expert. All of us need to be a routine expert at some point. However, when things change, when everything radically changes around you, your pad answers are no longer useful. They can be dangerous. 
So what they're trying to do now is find ways for educators to educate for adaptive expertise and still have some sense that when people leave, they have that quality, even though their adaptive expertise skills probably won't be called into uh, effect until they're much older, much further along in their professions. So it's kind of a leadership preparation. The thing that I have talked to the people in the center about is that those two, routine and adaptive expertise, are all reactive. They're reacting to things in the world. And designers are used to being interactive, that we create things in the world. So that design expertise is actually the thing that's really needed because it's not uh, sustainable to only be in a reactive mode, no matter how successful you are as an adaptive uh, expert. Russ Acoff, uh, who's a systems scientist and started off as an architect, by the way, uh, had this great saying that if you know that you want to get away from a situation that you don't like and you start backing away from it, the only thing you're assured of is that you're going to get away from what you don't like. It doesn't assure you that you're going to wind up where you want to be. And you have to be an interactive, proactive kind of design approach to sort of decide where you want to be and move towards there. So design, I believe, is necessary. And we can show that it's necessary. Now, the big one that comes up a lot, especially when you're working with an NSF-funded program or uh, people who are very strong scientists, is they want to know about credibility and legitimacy of design. And for good reason. I mean, there's a lot of acting out in the design fields. And you read the literature about design. And there's a stuff happening. And they want to know, are you disciplined? Are you, you know, do you have some kind of rigor in what you're doing? How do we know that you're not just going to lead us down a garden path? So my response is that we can't show credibility and legitimacy unless it's on our own terms. It has to be on the terms of design, not on science or art or the humanities. And we get judged from those other perspectives a lot. But we need to develop our own perspective. And then we can talk about and work with legitimacy and credibility. So I have some postulates that uh, I'm going to give you where I've started thinking. And I've asked some people from around the world uh, if they would be interested in coming together at some point and starting to talk about some basic design postulates for if design is going to be taken seriously. And postulates are those things that are considered to be self-evident truths. And in Ambrose Bierce's dictionary, Devil's Dictionary, self-evident is defined as evident to oneself and oneself only. So these postulates are evident to me and me only. I haven't talked to colleagues or talked them into this yet. One of the big ones is that description and explanation do not prescribe action. I can't tell you how many times I've gone into organizations and they point to volumes of studies and complain nothing has changed. We have studied our organization. We've had all these consultants coming in. We've spent millions of dollars studying. Exactly. There's no reason that things could cha should change because description and explanation do not prescribe action. I use an example of a, a huge study that was done on the High Plains, where the High Plains have now lost so many people that they qualify to be considered frontier according to the 1870 definition of what frontier is. There's more buffalo and Native Americans now in the High Plains than there were back in the 1870s. And they have volumes of st studies on this. But what does that mean? What do you do about it? Do we go out and kill the buffalo again, or what? It tells you nothing tells you nothing about what to do. Action can be taken through design, however. Design is a tradition of action. Prediction and control do not justify action. That means that prediction and control are not a, a justification or a substitution for ethics. 
So when somebody from a technologic background says, we want to create this new life form and we can control it so it doesn't get out like the last ones did. And we have it controlled and we're going to have this certainty of an outcome. Well, that doesn't justify it. Even if they can do it, it's not a substitute for ethics. And design has a huge uh, dimension of ethics involved in it for something that I'll talk about a bit later. So anyway, I want to talk about then design. Um, and I want to talk about it as the first tradition and the third culture. So in the sense of the first tradition, we make the case that uh, in the Western uh, uh, cultures anyway, there's this bias towards every major uh, human achievement in that it was either a discovery or an invention. And what we say to get attention is that, for instance, we didn't discover fire as humans, we designed it. We designed the technology of fire. And there's studies now about the, the design of fire and the cooking of food changed us biologically because we were able to tame fire, use it as a technology, cook our food. We changed ourselves biologically. We didn't invent the wheel, we designed it. My ancestors weren't skiing through the forests of northern Sweden and suddenly they stumble across a wheel and say, oh, look, somebody invented a wheel. That didn't happen that way. would say that design, as the first tradition, was one of the things that began to make us distinct as humans. Our ability to create our cosmologies, our belief systems, all the other things that followed. And design is a third culture. We're making the case that as an architect, I was always told that architecture was a midpoint between science and art. That's the reason I had to have all those math classes, and that's the reason that I had those painting classes, because it was this midpoint between these two traditions of inquiry. And different from the midpoint experiences, like Stanford has a design program where they require you to get a degree at both extremes. You get a degree in engineering, you get a degree in art, and then you somehow are anointed as a designer. And that seems like a fairly painful way to um, educate or be educated as a designer, but it's, it's worked, I guess. They have some fairly successful people. Anyway, we're making the case that design is a third culture of inquiry. It's rational, it's aesthetic, but it's not formed by those traditions that are mostly rational or aesthetic. Another part is reclaiming lost ground in design. So for instance, in philosophy, it's a hyphenated uh, Greek term meaning the love of philosophy. So Sophia meant wisdom. And in the pre-Socratic era, Sophia meant the wise hand. So the Greeks, when they would make something, they would be amazed that they could make something like a ship appear in the world that had never existed before. And they would wonder about that and talk about it. And they would philosophize about the making of things in the world. And uh, during the Socratic era, so Sophia was split into those who thought about things like first principles and those who did things or made things. And in the Plato's Republic, for instance, you'll see that uh, those who made things fell to the bottom of the hierarchy and those who thought about things were at the top of the hierarchy. And that's the hierarchy that we have sort of uh, inherited from that tradition now. So we have white collar, blue collar. We have people who think, people who do. I mean, every part of our lives you can see that kind of duality played out. And for design it doesn't make any sense to split that. It doesn't make any sense not to reconstitute Sophia. In these online conversations with PhD designers and others, there's this huge 
argument all the time about whether a PhD should be for research or for practice. Enemy camps. And my approach is that we need to reconstitute Sophia. It doesn't make any sense to keep the, in design, it doesn't make any sense to keep those two things separate. So the consequences of a design perspective like this, built as a third tradition with all these other things I talked about. For example, innovation, which is kind of a, a catchphrase nowadays. Everybody's talking about innovation. So that 20th century innovation was defined by the um, motto for the 1933 Chicago World's Fair. And, um, Innovation was described as a, a process where science finds, industry applies, and man conforms. And this, believe it or not, is still the norm. I just read parts of the administration's new white paper on innovation, and page two or three, this pyramid appears as the way innovation takes place. And by the way, I don't believe innovation is another term for design or for creativity. It is its own thing. But innovation is an important part of the design process. So anyway, if you take a design perspective of innovation, it could be, for instance, that society determines, science verifies, and technology enables. That could be from a design perspective. One of the things that I believe firmly is that if our educational systems are successful with the younger generations coming up, they're no longer going to be satisfied to adapt to whatever the hell comes out of a lab someplace. Whatever technology wants to do, they're not going to be satisfied with adapting with whatever happens. It's not going to, it's not going to happen that way. Already people are pushing back, they're wanting more say about what the priorities are, what we should be doing, what we do want assistance in. And it's not eliminating science or any of the uh, technology, for sure. It's just rearranging how you go about engaging in the, in the innovation process. So what about designers in all of this? We've been talking about designing. So I think designers sort of assume roles at some point, and it can be like homo faber, homo creator, demi argus, the creator god. We can assume those roles. But the most interesting, I mean, those, that's interesting when people do that, uh, when they assume these kind of roles. But I think, for me, one of the most interesting things is a role that I think designers are born into. And there is an archetypal uh, a, a mythic figure that appears in African myth, uh, e Asian, Middle Eastern myths, and this is a, in, in the Greek myths. Um, there's a lame god, and usually the lame god is a smith, works with fire and metal. And in this Greek, this particular Greek story about Hephaestus, the lame god, for whatever reasons he was lame, there's several versions. But because he had the full potential of the gods, but he didn't have the full ability of the other gods, he was lamed. Maybe not literally, but in all the figurative uh, sort of notations. He had to build things to aid him in his work. And he learned how to make things. And he made things like uh, robots that would help him walk and help him get around. He designed things like moving tripods that would carry heavy loads for him. He designed a winged chariot. And then the other gods looked around and said, whoa, this is neat stuff. Could you get me a cool thing? You know, the, the kind of the version of the iPod or the iPhone. Can you get me like a, a shield? Or... So he started making stuff for all the other gods but he was not their equal. He had to overcome limitations. Designers, as we've uh, discovered, humans, have this incredible ability to create things of immense power. I mean, just immense power. 
we can do things that's almost unimaginable. We are godlike in what we can do. The problem is we don't know what we should do. We can do a lot of things, we don't know what we should do, and we don't know why we sh how we can know what we should know. And we can't guarantee what we do is going to be the right thing. So we have these handicaps. And the interesting thing is that the lame god archetype, Freud picked up this notion of prosthetic gods, that humans were prosthetic. And for me, I realized that in actuality, people don't want to live naturally. Nobody wants to live in a natural state. You don't want to succumb to the diseases and the terrors of the, the natural world. So we create, we amplify our strengths and our abilities. We add on things. It's not, this prosthetic God is not this idea of adding something that's missing that should have been there, that nature should have given us. So it's not adding things that have missing that are missing so it's not about meeting human needs it's about identifying and meeting human desires and people are pushing and even in the case of Hephaestus he was both the lame god and the prosthetic god in the same uh, person but I think this is a role that designers are born into and my wondering is given that we're not going to do enough research to overcome it. We're not going to get enough technology to overcome it. We're always going to be faced with this challenge. So how then do you practice? What do you do in the world when you know you can't be perfect? More knowledge isn't going to make you perfect. More technology is not going to make you perfect. You're, we're not going to get there. So what do you do? switching gears now a bit is now looking at these at the designers that have these kinds of challenges that come from this third tradition I've used the uh, model that uh, Ernest Boyer uh, presented in a Carnegie Foundation um, report on scholarship reconsidered and he said that other than uh, the traditional research service teaching uh, credentials or, or uh, measurements that you have in uh, academic life. What should be considered is the scholarship of discovery, the scholarship of integration, the scholarship of application, and the scholarship of teaching. And what I've done is I've said, okay, from a design perspective, maybe design scholarship ought to be about inquiry, systemics, service, and design learning. In the meaning the same way, it's just that it's from a design perspective that this has changed. So that, for instance, design research and inquiry has these four questions, not the one about what is true, which is the one that science is so good at, helping us understand what's true. We have these four questions. What's true, what's real, what would be ideal, and what should or ought to be made real. That's part of our inquiry as designers in our scholarship. In the service side, um, Naomi Remen, this was one of those triggering things when um, I read her work. She was, uh, or she is, at the uh, University of San Francisco in the uh, medical school. But she talked about service in a much different way than I'd ever imagined. And one of the things that uh, I've so come to believe is that what distinguishes designers from artists, from scientists, from all other people, all the other professions, is that we're in a service relationship. We create for others. We serve others. It's an interrelationship. And she put it into a, a kind of a nice perspective in that mostly people want to help or fix. And that's not a good idea for these reasons. And when you, I was working in the United Nations and, and other international development projects, you're doing good. You're doing good in the world. You're helping. You're fixing people. And you're there for a little while, and pretty soon they want you to hell out of their lives. Because what you do is you're treating them as unequal. You're treating them as helpless and you wind up, they wind up owing you. You put them into debt. 
and they resent that. Design in a service relationship is you engage with an equal. Just like a contract that an architect or anybody else has with a client. It's between two equals. For a real contract, a, a, a legal contract to take place, you have to have it between two equals. So service, I think, is a huge dimension of, of design in this way. It's not in the way that uh, that software company that developed the big foundation with millions of dollars that's investing in fixing and helping the world. It would be so nice if we had a way to introduce design as a way to work in the world with some of the issues that, same issues that they're trying to work with. It would be, I think. Systemics is the other piece and that Systemics is the term now being used to include things like systems thinking, systems science, general systems theories, all the things that you may have been uh, aware of or introduced to. Uh, whenever I used to talk about what I did as, with a systems background, I had to go through that whole list. Well, it's systems thinking and it's systems science and it's systems approach. And so we use the term systemics now uh, for this work. Then to come to the visible and the invisible, the approaches to design that I wanted to talk about. And to tell you that this is just my perspective of these approaches to design, and they're nothing new. It's nothing that I created. It's just a way that I began to see it. So that the first one, the focused design, and I love this picture of the iceberg because um, when I'm talking to people, and especially designers, and I'm talking about things that uh, are behind the work, the values or the perspectives or the cultural issues that are behind the work, they say, that's too abstract. I, I need to see the stuff. I need the experience. I need to. So it's in that realm of focused design around the particular. That's the piece that we can see. That's the piece that um, uh, your uh, portfolios show. That's the piece that uh, show up in the journals. That's the piece that people see and talk about. Um, what I want to talk about is two that are sort of been or have been invisible, but they've been there. Whether they've been engaged in with uh, people who call themselves professional designers or not, they've been used. And that, that's this notion of systemic design and deep design. And systemic design in this case is that uh, systems is the logic of design, system science. Not necessarily reductive science, system science is the logic of design. Design is about how things are put together, <laughs> relationships, compositions. In different language, system science is concerned about the same things. So for syst uh, systemic design, it means two things. It's about design inquiry and it's about real things called systems. When I was uh, working with Eric on uh, some research on what design competent organizations were, we looked uh, at a new concept center that Boeing had developed. One of the top people in Boeing had snuck money and things aside and put this building out in the forest and developed a concept center for the new planes. And we were studying that with him for several years. And the interesting thing to me was Alan, his, the responsibility for the plane was where the passengers and the baggage was. But what, what he had his design team doing was things like outside of the plane. So that instead of handling baggage, why don't we take companies like FedEx, have them pick up baggage, deliver it to wherever people are going, It'll be at their hotels. We don't have to have baggage space. So he defined the system, what he was working with, well outside of what they would traditionally have defined their design limit. You know in that, that little diagram where it was the traditional uh, uh, concerns of designers? He went well, well beyond that, quite successfully. And he did an interesting thing with the concept center he went up one day and there was all 30 of the engineers sitting around at their computer things talking to one another and he said, the next three weeks we're not going to use our computers. We're going to go down in the shop 
and we're going to start building prototypes. Three weeks, they did something like, I'm not sure how the exact number, but something like 20, 23 patentable ideas came out of that three weeks. And there was an average for Boeing, like nine months, 10 months, for one patentable idea. They did that in three weeks. They had engineers fighting to get into this concept center. He kept it secret from the other managers so they couldn't kill it. And then when they discovered how successful it was, all the other divisions wanted to start their own concept centers. But he was using a systems approach to his design, to defining what the system was that he was designing. And it wasn't taken as a given. So systems. <clears throat> as real things are things that we deal with. And I would say that nothing we create, nothing that we do as designers or people is not part of a system. Whether you believe in systems thinking or not, what you do, what you create is part of a system. Nothing is in a vacuum. Nothing exists in a vacuum. So the habit of just kind of doing something and throwing it out and then watching what happens, those are systemic reactions, whether or not we take it into account. Then systems inquiry. <clears throat> this is kind of an uphill battle. And one of the problems is that, and there's several traditions, uh, belief systems, where uh, there are stories about hu humans becoming all uppity and getting together and starting to, to do things that was going to transcend to what the work of God was. And Yahweh or somebody had to step in and smack them and scatter them around. So actually, all this, this, this specialization and this fractionalization was a good thing from this perspective. And when you talk about unity of knowledge, um, people are sort of concerned about, well, what does that do to diversity? We fought so long for some diversity. What are you telling me? We all got to go be the same thing again, which is no. Mostly, unity of knowledge in this case for me is about starting things like conversations. And the definition of a conversation is being in the same place with people turning together. So it's a conversation of diversity. It's not sameness. It is about trying to develop centers of inquiry. <clears throat> so one of the things that um, Eric and I had discovered working with different corporations was that there was a huge problem for corporations, maybe not anybody else, but uh, this notion of the abandoned center. That as specialization and diversification came in, pretty soon a company didn't know who was in charge and what they were supposed to be doing and how they were going to do anything together. It doesn't sound like a university, does it? It's mostly just organizations out there. So, I mean, I've been, I've experienced working together with people, and then they say, uh, you know, I think we're doing it different from them. I think we need to go, and we're going to start this thing. We'll let them. And so you're over here, and then you're over here, and it's, you know, by the way, I don't even think I'm doing the same thing you are. I think I'm going to. So you just keep fracturing and fracturing and fracturing, and nobody can talk to anybody. You become more specialized even uh, in what you've your little fractured part of uh, what's going on. And the way we characterize the, the sort of uh, response to this, I mean, if some people don't think this is a good idea to have this abandoned center. Some people work to have this kind of thing. But some people think that's not a good thing because we really do have to get something done. And it takes kind of collaboration. So we have what we call the soft centers, which is where you bring in multiple disciplines all bringing in their own particular universal truths, beliefs, postulates into a center. And then you kind of try to mush it into and form something that will work, an inquiring process. Or you have the hard center where there's a belief that there is just a fixed set of truths, of, of generalities, and of universalities. Everything flows from that. So, I'm affiliated with the uh, engineering department or school in uh, University of Washington. Every one of those schools has a different term for force. But it's all the same sort of thing. There's different mathematical formulas for it. 
it's all the same thing. It all comes out of something fundamental that each one has taken. So that, um, I don't know if you've ever read the, uh, any books on consilience. What was it? Wilson? Yeah, E.O. Wilson wrote a book on consilience. It's an interesting book. I'd, I'd uh, suggest that you read that because he makes a case that science, in fact, shares just some basic fundamental truths from which everything flows. So that's another strategy. What our strategy is uh, for design is to think about this thing as a liquid center so that we work with things in solution. And there are all sorts of methodologies and techniques that have been developed in order to support that kind of work. And I won't, don't be scared, I'm not going to take you through all of those, but there are things. It's like I get asked a lot, so what? It's a nice image, you know, okay, so what? And there is a lot of so what's in place to support that kind of work. It makes sense in a lot of ways. So talk about the second piece that I sort of uh, revealed at least to myself was something I call deep design. And my schema is I've divided deep design into these different categories, particular purpose, intention, and center. And a critique process is one that goes from the particular, from whatever is, has been designed or created, down through purpose, intention, and to the center. A good critique. So that at one time, this one laptop for child issue was going. And there was so much being generated about whether or not that was a good design. And I was collecting all of this volumes for, for the center. And it was all about the particular. What color was it? How much did it weigh? How long did the batteries last? Never really got into any kind of purpose, intention, or center. So you don't know if it was a good design. Something created for this particular context may serve the purpose and intention perfectly, may be great. You move it to another one, and it may be the worst thing that could happen. But people want you to make a critique of the particular. And it used to drive me crazy in architecture school, because you'd go to the crits and listen to the student, your, other, your fellow students and the faculty critiquing and it was like they were making things up. And it was in tongues. And it was like a, a, a debate in the United Nations. And it was like, you know, there's got to be a better way of coming up with evaluating designs. I still think there's uh, this better way. In practice, when certain architectural fashions or style used to rise to the top, well, I was out on the left coast then, we would blame it on the East Coast journalists. and critics who would choose whoever their favorite style or fashionist would be, and they would elevate that person to good design. It didn't drive us crazy, because nobody was elevating us. No, it's, it didn't seem like there was a good reason. And this is part of when a scientist or somebody from another inquiry tradition wants to know, are you rigorous? I mean, what is it? Are you just? acting out. What's, what's going on? And this is my response to that, that we can, in fact, from our own tradition, make very good critiques. And by reversing it, we can also create very solid designs, beautiful, wonderful designs. And of course, there's much more to this. But what I want to do now is I want to introduce how this little schema sort of came to me and how I've begun using it with things that I love. These are things that I was particularly attached to. And I mean things. I mean the appearance of something. I was saving my money so I could buy Shaker furniture. I had volumes on Shaker architecture and Shaker furniture. And I loved Scandinavian design, of course. And it would have been heavily influenced by uh, uh, Shaker design. And then there was uh, this wonderful uh, woman who was part of the Shaker uh, tradition. And I read her quote, and it just sort of, I, I couldn't ever go back to just things. 
And she said, I would like to be remembered as one who had pledged myself to the service of God and had fulfilled that pledge as perfectly as I can and not as a piece of furniture. And I thought, you think that's more to this design than just a pretty chair? Oh. Or this kind of nice barn? What is she saying? I started looking into that. I started looking into the tr Shaker tradition. I started to try to understand this notion of how they were trying to represent perfection on earth as they saw it in heaven. This whole sort of, they were grounded deep. And I've put it in the kind of overlay of my little schema so that I have what's at the center, what's the aim or intention, what's its purpose, what's its ends and means, what is it serve ends and means, and then what do you actually experience or see? What actually comes into the world? And for me, that was much more satisfying than just collecting Shaker furniture, even though I still covet Shaker furniture. Another thing that I loved, I spent several, uh, I spent over a year in Finland during the, just the end of its golden era of design, it was called, and I've been back several times. And I love Finland, and I love their design, and I thought, and I love the Finns, and I thought, I'll try that with the Finns. And I had made this little rug. I'd gotten the, the, the yarn and everything and the pattern from uh, this museum in uh, Helsinki. And so I felt like, not just maybe being Swedish heritage, I was a little Finn, too. And I looked at it, in the, at it in the same way, and it was at this golden, what's called the golden age of Finland, and what they had done was they designed their nation using design. They designed their identity as who they were. Why did they have to do that? They were three tribes in the same peninsula that had been dominated either by the Russians or the Swedes for hundreds of years. They had never been a nation. They had never been a culture. And when the Russians pulled out in the 60s, they had to form themselves as a nation, have an identity. Who are we in common? And they used design. And one of the first things they did was they created their narrative of their, what's called their national epic, their story, which was um, a sort of a mythic tale of the Finnish people. And that was published, and that became the sort of aim at how they unfolded that character, whatever was inside that. And of course, if you know the Finns and most of the Scandinavians, you understand that their religion is nature and reason. They have that marvelous mix of being able to uh, bring both the most rational, critical eye as well as this total uh, involvement with nature, this love of nature. And all these beautiful things that I love, altos, buildings, Pietla, I worked for an architect, Rima Pietla. I mean, they're just incredible set the standard for the world for decades. Also, I used to do pottery a lot. And one of the things that I got very interested in was something called raku, which is low-fired pottery. Beautiful. It introduced me to the idea of wabi-sabi, you know, this imperfect aesthetic. And what I discovered was that Raku was created to create or make teacups for the tea ceremony. And I was one of those people that would have loved to have collected these teacups, these Raku teacups, except they cost thousands and thousands of dollars. Saved me. I had to make my own. They came, this, this teacup, this process, came out of this tradition of Zen Buddhism. And I looked into what that was. What were they up to? What was the intention of that? What was its center? What was the, all of the things that unfolded? What was the tea house, the, the gardens, all of those things that came out of that particular tradition? So that's just an example of three things that I love dearly that I applied my little schema to. And I would make the case that any really good design has that same or some version of the same sort of heritage. Even, even bad design, if you looked at it closely, maybe the core is rotten, but it has a core, and it's coming from something. 
designers may not even be aware of the traditions they're working from, the value systems they're working from. They're just doing stuff, especially if they pick up styles and they're, they're copying or mim mimicking people. But that's there. Those deeper intentions, deeper values are there. So anyway, creating culture of design, as I said in the beginning, is this notion of going back and looking at design practice and design learning, given this change, this, this design perspective, the, the visibility that I think we can gain. And those things, like I say, those two, deep design and systemic design, have been around for thousands of years. But it's just been invisible to us. We're sort of rediscovering, in some sense, what people have been doing forever. Why things count, why we love certain things. So anyhow, design learning, for instance, I think we can design curriculum based on what we think the center of inquiry is from a systems perspective from a design perspective, for designers. This isn't for scientists, it isn't necessarily for people in literature or anything, history, none of that, it's for designers. But I think we can create a relevant curriculum for designers based on these traditions. And the other one is creating a design culture, which is creating the crucibles and containers that hold designers in their work. And that's essential. I mean, one of the things that always interested me, I, was in, I always like to, uh, you, you know, this pri process that the alchemists go through that I had dismissed early on because people would say what they were trying to do was turn lead into gold. Well, the tradition really was, what's the process of going from unknowing to knowing? But in all the models that they show you on the alchemists is they never talked about the crucible, the thing that held the fire and the heat and the molten stuff. And the design work is that. It's very hot. It's very viscous. It's liquid. It's hard to hold. And you need some kind of crucible to hold that. That's what society does. And we are in partnership. They give us our agency. They're the ones that are setting priorities and the values for what they want from us. So they need to be a part of what the process is. They need to form the crucible and the containers. Containers sort of hold the seeds of the ideas and the, the designers until they've had time to mature, kind of stand on their own. We need that kind of holding and containing. And society needs to be a part of that. We need to be educating the, society, the, the people in society as much as ourselves. They're as much a part of our profession as we are. They really need to know what's going on. They really need to know they're a part of it. And we need to know that they are a part of it. That we're in a service-defined field, not in a self-service field. Finally, one addendum is that, of course, the next thing is I'm interested in how focused design, systemic design, deep design come into a kind of a composite. That's the, my system side. I want to know how these disparate approaches to design all come together. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Um, would you be willing to take some questions? Does anybody have any questions? God. Robert Sandusky could not be here this evening, but he wanted to be sure that I ask you to respond to this question. Wes Churchman and others spoke of hard systems and soft systems, hard systems being more determinate than soft systems and therefore easier to bring into the design process. The design discipline uses the systems approach that includes both hard and soft systems. However, because of the difficulty in bounding soft systems, practitioners are often left to depend upon the contained knowledge of the bounded hard system to a greater extent than the open-ended, unbounded soft system. How do designers create soft system boundaries without being totally arbitrary in that judgment? I'm going to get Robert. <laughs> I practiced architecture with Robert. 
for years. Um, the short answer, and, and I think a very good answer for him, is that one of the things that's missing that I didn't talk about in our understandings is the importance of judgment versus decision making. And we create boundaries like that around our work, like in the Boeing incident, that judgment that Alan made about what the system was that he was going to be designing with was a judgment call. There wasn't something out there sitting in reality that he could choose. So I make the case that designers are only valuable to, to society because we make consistently good judgments. And judgments don't have right or wrong outcomes, they only have consequences. They're different from decision making in that they can't be separated from the one. In decision making, you can separate that knowledge, put it into a library, into a database. Judgment calls can only be seen in action as a consequence, and they can't be separated from the knower. And that's a big part, believe it or not, of what designers do all the time is make judgments. And guess what? Scientists and the best scientists have, some of the best scientists I've talked to will admit that judgment is a huge part of their work. They have to make judgment calls on when to stop doing research, for instance. They have to make judgment calls about what to research. It's a huge piece and we don't bring judgment into our educational systems hardly at all. I didn't even know, for instance, like Kant, I studied Kant, Immanuel Kant, a German philosopher, and he had these two famous volumes on practical knowledge and on rational knowledge, and we had to study and everything. And it wasn't until I got involved with this whole issue of judgment that I found out he had a third volume on judgment. And people don't like the term judgment because of this other term called judgmentalism. There was a famous, um, I don't remember his name right now, in Stanford, um, uh, on the creative process, and his process was handed around uh, all the time about uh, including, don't hold, withhold judgment. Withhold judgment till the end. And so judgment became bad for designers. It's something you withheld, you avoided. In fact, you can't start without judgment. Something called enabling judgment. We can't start our work until we make judgments about what we're doing, who we're doing it for, all those things. It's huge. So, Robert, there's your answer. Anyone else? So, Harold, you've been here for a few weeks now. And you can probably see that Carnegie Mellon is largely a soft center in that when we as designers go out to collaborate with people, it's within that frame. So how can we teach our designers to move towards a liquid center? I mean, the, the multiple perspectives like that is okay as long as it has these others. So that multiple perspectives for me, multiple disciplines is sort of like the old story of the blind men touching the elephant and they're all describing the elephant as being something different depending on which part of the elephant that they were hanging on to. That's that kind of multidisciplinary piece everybody's in their own place describing. The trick there is that there is an elephant and what you need to have is somebody who sees and can hold the whole elephant so that he can say what all these different perspectives mean. For design, the challenge is that there is no elephant. Nothing has been created. So what do you do with those different perspectives all hanging on to different parts of something? So that takes a, a bit of management in that case. And it's sort of like, I mean, there's a, there's a, a very successful professional studio called IDEO. And they take people from all sorts of backgrounds and they're working, but those people aren't on interdisciplinary teams. They're people with different backgrounds doing the same work, which is design. And I think that's really the trick, is that you engage, no matter what your background, you engage in the same kind of work. You agree that you're gonna be a designer. You may be an anthropologist, you may be you know, a historian, whatever, but you agree we're all gonna work 
as designers. And that's different from being multidisciplinary, I believe. Yeah, you can that response about different disciplines using design or design activities. Uh, you mentioned a lot about designers. Uh, most of the time you mentioned about uh, professional designers that think I wonder if you comment on design ability that could be used by people who are not calling themselves designers, for example, anybody in your definition could be designing at any moment. Uh, in their lives in a smaller scale. So that just goes to make you comment on design ability in the context of like kind of like Yeah. I would say I'd make the case that design ability, design competence, comes to us from the first ancestor that was a human. And that everybody designs at some time. It doesn't matter whether you've been anointed as a designer or you've self-selected yourself as a designer or you're just somebody working in a factory. Everybody engages in design. We design our lives. We design our kids' lives. We design a day. I mean, people engage in design. And before the Industrial Revolution, when the formal terms of designers came to the fore so much, um, people were still designing. We had temples and ships, and we had all that stuff, and castles, and all kinds of things. People have been designing for thousands of years without calling themselves designers. I mean, like the Greeks would call out people who made things as argoi, or, or the ones who made for others. So there was that understanding that there were specialists who would do that. But still, people were designing policies back then. They were designing belief systems. They were designing. We design all the time. And the interesting thing to me is, like, if you look around this room, how much is natural? Everything has been made by somebody. And who we are, what our memories are, who we think we are as people, is 90% based on what we've experienced that it's been designed, not nature, not natural. So designers from the beginning have been designing, creating the world. We say the creation myth didn't stop in the seventh day with rest. It's going on, and we're a part of that as designers. But everybody's doing that. Then for the extra question, if that's the case, what would, if we design, if we can all design, why is that education is necessary? Because we get much better at it, I think. Because it can help, as a matter of fact, if um, you're trying to design your child's life, if you work with somebody who has worked a lot with child development and that, it really helps to have people who know. And it helps if we have people who have certain skills and abilities, who can make good judgments. I mean, that's one of the things that uh, I think good designers do is they make good judgments consistently. We have to be able to do that. And we can call ourselves professionals if we get very good at it. If we get very good at, for instance, one of the things that I think good designers can do is listen to what people are saying and hear what they want, even though people can't say the word. I mean, I can't tell you how many public meetings I've been a part of where there's been some kind of federal or governmental development or pu private development. And so, oh, we're going to get the, the people's voice. So you put people in there, and they're fighting and swearing and arguing at one another. So, OK, we had public input. Now we're going to go do. Well, you never, you never brought them or listened to them. You just expected them to respond from some kind of uh, unknown place. You didn't help them become a part of uh, the design process. And if, you don't, if they don't have time to sit around and become really f reflective, you can listen and hear. I've seen good designers do this. You can hear what they're trying to say, and then what you create speaks to them. And the best design that I've ever seen is where people recognize themselves immediately in what appears. And there's no convincing. There's no selling. There's none of that. No, this is good for you. You should have one of these. You really need one. You should be a part of this. If it's a good design, they see themselves in it immediately, and it's theirs. And innovation is almost instantaneous. Innovation being the process where something new becomes a part of somebody else's life. Innovation is almost instantaneous when they see themselves 
served and they see themselves in the design. So when you have skills like that, then it's worthwhile calling yourself out, I think, as a, a designer. Architecture is one of those wonderful things where you can practice successfully as a scientist or as an artist. So people inhabit machines and they dwell in sculptures, but I think it's at its best when it's treated as a design tradition. Any other questions? Chris? Um, pick up on some of the themes. If, uh, so if a child psychologist has the knowledge and expertise to design an intervention um, into, for a child's uh, life, and also scientists, for instance, design experiments and they teach courses in the design of experiments. And there are lots of design elements in most fields. What expertise, if, you're, if you have a model of bringing expertise to the table, um, does, do schools of design bring to the table? One is the ability to um, manage design processes, which are very fairly complex, especially nowadays. So that, I mean, designing an experiment may be complex at one level, but it's not complex socially, in a way. Well, not as the complex. The people who design the experiments at uh, the big labs, like the big high energy accelerators, and those are pretty socially complex. Yeah, I don't know. I've worked, like when I was working at the Lawrence Berkeley lab, and we were working on energy policy for federal development, and the physicist from Lawrence Livermore got involved, and they turned the energy policy into a um, efficiency code for a machine. And they actually had to abandon some of the buildings that the state of California built because it was unhealthy for people. So they were very good, very good at creating efficient machines. They were not very good at working with people as the clients and with others. There's others, there were others of us that were trying to say, wait a minute, you can't create a hermetically sealed environment for people to live in. So that's what I mean, is that in, in my experience with these complex issues, the ability to work with diverse types of people for a common purpose, for a common purpose. I think that's one of the skills that we have. And to create uh, a order and structure out of complexity. That's in the, the, create compositions. Um, when I mean, the, the whole idea of, of being able to describe and explain and do that quite well, but not know then what you're supposed to do, that's when designers can help because they know how to talk with those who are value experts, those who can set the priorities, those who can understand. And um, another, I had a professor at Berkeley, this is telling you how long ago it was, he used to smoke these little cigars all the time in class. And he um, held up two matches. And he says, OK, I want you to describe what's similar about the two matches. And we were brilliant graduate students at Berkeley. So we just started listing all these things that were similar about these two matches. He says, OK, tell me what's different about the two matches. Oh, well, we can do that. So we started doing that and describing He says, OK, your value is going to be in deciding what's important to know about those two matches. And that, I think, is one of the things that designers can do in their service relationship with clients is to help define that kind of boundary that makes those kinds of judgments. What's important? What, what should be made real? And then enable people who know then a lot about science and technology help you make that a reality. Is that possible? No, you can't do it that way. You've got to do it. OK. So then you can design experiments in order to support what you're trying to do. That's an invaluable. And, and the ability to work in those kind of alliances, I think, is invaluable as a designer. Yeah. 
or somebody with a, a design perspective. The business school dean at Rotman says that the most successful corporate leaders are designers, whether or not they call themselves that. But what they're doing is design work, the most successful ones. And I say that even leaders are designers, that those are interchangeable terms so that not necessarily what would come out of a particular specialized school skill, but in that kind of larger design approach, thinking skill, I think that's what designers bring to the table. There's a lot of discussion about accountability and responsibility for design and how long you're responsible for what you create for the, the conditions. Uh, but I would say mostly that designers play a part in assessing whether or not a design was good. But obviously the people who really make the assessment are the ones who live with it and who the design was created for. They understand their value systems can make sense out of it. You can sort of ask and interrogate them. Did you mean this? Is this working? What do you mean? But you can't say, uh, uh, for instance, that uh, you're a Luddite. You, you need to get on with this stuff, or you're going to get left behind. Uh, you may be on the right track, but if you're not moving, you're going to get run over. All those kinds of things where you sort of make the valuations for them. You have to make it with them and be able to sort of have that kind of conversation, especially if you work from the beginning with them, is this what you were saying that you wanted from the beginning? Is this what you wanted to see in response to my work as a designer? Then you can say whether or not it was successful. So, Thank you. Thanks. I'm wondering if we can continue the conversation informally. We, we have a reception that we'd love to invite everyone to attend downstairs in A11. Is that right? So I think, you know, Harold would have the opportunity to chat with the rest of you, but we're losing people, and I want to make sure that we all move down and enjoy the refreshments. And join me in thanking you so much.